ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Hey guys, welcome back to another Q&A where we answer your questions from Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Ready to get started? Yeah, let's go. All right, let's dive in. First question, as a Caribbean medical student, do I have any chance of getting anything else besides family medicine or internal medicine? Quick, sure. Yeah, the quick answer is yes. The yes. short answer is yes. Why wouldn't you? Um, I know people are always doubting themselves. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can't get into surgery. We know dozens, if not sure. more than a couple dozen doctors who went to Caribbean schools get into surgery. The difference though is they don't have that mindset. They go, I want to be a surgeon. I want to go into OB. I want to go into ER. I will do everything I can from day one to study, do well in my classes, take my notes, make my index cards, work well, pass my comp exam, pass my step one, create my my application right, to make sure that I'm a well-rounded candidate, volunteer, internship, externship, do what needs to be done. And guess what? Before you know it, there are surgeons, first year residents. Simple as that. Yeah. If you have that mindset, well, then, then you're going to, that's going to affect your performance on step one. Well, just bare minimum. It's not easy to get into family, by the way, or psych. They're, they're very competitive as well. Yeah, there's a lot of students who go unmatched every single year just trying to get into the, the, the primary care stuff. Correct. But you, you put forth your best effort, do well on your exams, be well-rounded, demonstrate your passion for the field, and you can get into you can get into anything. The more competitive stuff like orthopedic surgery, plastic surgery, very, very tough and challenging, but not impossible. And every year, someone... Several people from Caribbean schools and IMGs, FMGs match into the most competitive specialties, dermatology. But they're they're all stars, and they started early, and they really built their resumes to reflect what they wanted out of their career. I mean, you think maybe ten years ago people would ask that question, but not today. I don't know why people keep still. You went to the Caribbean. It was your choice to go to the islands. Okay, fair, fine. But nowadays, with social media, with advertising, with you know everyone working hard, with the resources available, you can accomplish anything your heart desires. Sure. But you just got to put the hard work in. Now, if you don't want to go to the Caribbean, then work hard, get to a DOMD program in the States. Simple. It's all one or the other, but you can't get there. But, I mean, you get into a, a U.S. school, that doesn't guarantee you anything. Yeah, you still need to be a stud to oh. get into a competitive specialty. <laughs> we have many doctors we're working with now who eventually get into, done well in step one, step two, but many of them reached out to us with multiple attempts on one and two. Mm -hmm. Because they're in school doesn't mean you're going to be a good student. You just got into, you did well in the MCATs and got into a school. Yeah. So, I got to keep studying. Absolutely. All right, next question. What should my CK score range be to be a competitive applicant for family medicine as a Caribbean med student? I got this one. Go There's it. actually two questions we got. Uh, someone asked family, someone asked anesthesia. So let's combine this. The Go to aamc.org. Very simple. Yes. Pull up the recent match data and you can look at every specialty. You can see how the lowest tiered students who matched scored, how much research they had, how much volunteer work they had, the middle of the line, and then the upper echelon. And you can see what the average scores are. Step one, when they had three digits, CK, number of, of everything, volunteer work, blah, blah, blah. And you want to see what did the top students achieve? And then you should aim for that. You don't want to just be middle of the road. You want to be competitive. Sure. So just look at that and then use that information. Really, that's all you can do. But if you wait till the last minute to do this, you're going to be in trouble. So start early because there's a lot of work that goes into building a really solid application. And if you don't want to, if you don't want to take that advice, and perhaps you don't want to use that that link to get to that page, even more of a simpler answer: two fifty points. Sure. I mean, it's the higher the better, right? Yep. That's what it comes. Don't think the bare minimum. Use that link that Dr. Paul pro provided and do your research. But at the same time, shoot for the stars, so then you could open up your your doors for other options. So let's say family isn't that. Maybe you love OB. Maybe you got you did a wonderful pediatric rotation. Now you're in love with it. So the higher the score, the better chances of having leverage down the line. Love it. Next question. I'm a U.S. med student, but failed step one and only scored a 219 on CK. So this student failed step one. Okay. Um, I don't have the step one score, but they have a failure. Scored okay. 219 on CK. And then the question is, do I have a chance of matching? I'm assuming they passed the second time on step uh, one. Yeah, I believe. Okay, so they failed step one, passed the second time with whatever score. Now it's pass or fail, and they did it, you know, 219, 220 on CK. Um, again, if you're an American student, there, being that you, you, you're an American student, you have obviously maybe you have more opportunities in the hospitals, maybe more physicians, more connections. That being said, you need to really figure out and talk to your advisor 
which specialty you can possibly apply for versus what you need to know, what you need to do to add to your profile, right? So are you going to go for surgery? Possibly, most likely, maybe not. But you have to really add more value to your application because you can't add more score to, numbers to your score. It's really yeah. locked in concrete, right? So yeah, just um, as we always say, if you have deficiencies in one area, yeah. overcompensate in other areas. That's it. And everyone always asks, well, what does that mean? You know what you need to do. Look at your application. What does a, a residency application have? Has spots for volunteer work, for for research, for projects, blah 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 blah. Fill in those areas and overcompensate. I mean, that's all you can do. I'll give you a quick example. We have a colleague of ours who's a, a attending physician, anesthesiologist, Caribbean student. Failed step one once, failed CK once, got into anesthesia because he was good friends with a couple of physicians. But he worked very hard for a full year, year and a half, internships, externships, sub eyes at that university program in Florida. And then they go, well, you have attempts. But because we've seen you work so hard for a year and a half, seven days a week, we know that you are a hard worker. We know the value that if we invest in you. And this individual went in, worked very hard, got into residency, and now is an attending practice in Florida. So that's an example of many that we know. That's also a good example of if you have red flags, you have to go above and beyond. A year and a half with no pay, year and a half of working seven days a week, and it paid off for him. Yep. All right, next question. It takes me seven to eight hours to review a block of questions. What am I doing wrong? So let's. Let's figure out what they're doing wrong, and then let's talk about the optimal time to review a block of questions. Sure. You want this one? I mean, what are you doing wrong? It's impossible to say, but I can tell you, you're taking way, way, way too long. Too much. You're probably doing a couple of the things that we see that causes you to take forever is you're rewriting word for word everything in the entire explanation. Mm -hmm. um, the only time when it's acceptable that you take this long to do a block, and it shouldn't be a regular thing is if you get hammered in the block and you know you have to really go back and fill in a deficiency. Makes sense. But if it's if you're just doing a review, you're probably just <laughs> rewriting everything because I don't know what else you could possibly do that would take this much time. The other option is maybe you are screwing around during the day and that seven to eight hours also includes, right. oh, I went and had lunch oh, I'm on social media. I'm watching a YouTube video. I'm on Netflix. So that's just, I don't even know how you could physically take that much time to review a blog. Chances are, you need to learn how to write shorthand and you need to know what to pick out of an explanation to take notes on. Not everything because there's just no need for that. That's yeah. that's what I've seen over the years is the most likely cause. And I'll add two more to that because I just came to my mind. Another one could be you're doing a block of 40 mixed and you're jumping from one topic to another. Mm -hmm. So you're all over the place. You're about chem, immuno, embryology. And to add to that, you didn't really take time to review or use textbooks or a video series to kind of rebuild or build your foundation. You just jumped into 40 questions random and spending so much time trying to understand everything. Because if you're trying to understand the answer choices, explanations, that just tells me you jumped the gun, you went in too fast, and you're just not only putting you know timed fashion or you're putting mixed, but you're not really taking the time to understand the different conditions, different side effects and whatnot. So... Two what Dr. Paul said, two more what I said. One it has to be one of those four, if not all of them at the same time. What's the ideal amount of time someone should spend if they're being efficient? Block of forty, no more than two hours. Uh, you yeah, know, okay. if you're doing it, if you're doing a time, that's an hour for forty, another hour to review. If you're doing it untimed, granted, you know, read every answer choice, understand the explanations. But if you're not writing shorthand, if you're rewriting everything, if you're spending too much time digging through resources, you're gonna kill seven hours plus. So no more than two and a half hours for a block of forty. All right, next, the most. Next question. <laughs> when should I start dedicated step one prep if I'm in a six-year program? Okay. Dedicated step. I mean, I would say, I, I'm not, I don't care if it's five, six, seven, eight years, you know, stay on top of the material. So you can, because every day that you're studying and you're reviewing for the content for the topic in hand, like neurology, anatomy, you're adding to step one preparation. Now, mm -hmm. you're not taking the test tomorrow. But you add into your foundation. So if you're writing notes, taking index cards, creating index cards, whatever you're doing, using first aid on the side to kind of parallel your curriculum, if six years is usually international school, mm -hmm. I would stay on top of that. So then when you get to the point of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, like, oh, my tests come up in about five months or six months or seven, you're not starting at that point. You've been studying four plus years, reviewing and you know retaining that information. Because if you did anatomy in first year, by fifth year or fourth year, if not third, you won't retain anything. So study immediately, 
and as you keep studying, you keep adjusting to your schedule and adding more resources to your uh, daily routine. Yeah, this concept of dedicated prep sort of always boggles my mind a little bit because students really fail to understand that when you're in your basic sciences, you should be focusing on mastering the information for your class because that the, the better you do there, the easier your prep is going to be for step one. And your prep, like you said, you're prepping for step one while you do that. So if you are so focused on, I need to do well on step one, that you sort of put a, you know, your classes in the back seat and you focus more so on, I'm going to read the first day and do UWorld, you're missing, we've talked about this, a golden opportunity right, yeah, to put yourself in a position to crush your step one. And I know it's pass fail, but you should still be crushing it so that you then have a good foundation for CK, which is going to, you know, parlay into, uh, of course. you know, your shelf, all that stuff. Anyway, don't focus on dedicated. Don't worry about it. Worry about what am I doing today? If you're in classes, do well in classes. When you're done, like Dr. Stauber said, when you can see that your exam date's approaching, then we can talk about dedicated. But if you're in basic sciences, focus on basic sciences. If you're in a six year, focus on your classes. And then once you've got an exam date, then, then you can worry about dedicated. But at that point, if you've done it right, it shouldn't even be a big issue because you've prepped properly. Exactly. And think of it this way. When you're studying during school, you're working on your time management, working on your technique of yeah. studying, right? So that's going to transition over to studying for step one, step two, step three, any other exam that you're taking in your life. So you might realize, you know, I don't need to study. No, you do because you're working on your test taking skills and also your time management, your dedication, your discipline. Are you investing the right time into studying instead of having poor habits or bad habits and then riding through school and then later say, now I have to study. No, you should have been studying from day one. All right. We have one more question. This one is more. my favorite question I think we've ever gotten. <laughs> Settle a debate for me and my friends. Okay. Let's We're go. doing a rotation in Chicago and we have a differ and we have differing opinions on which place has the best deep dish. Wow. I like Giordano's and she likes Lou Malnati's. Mm -hmm. Settle this for us. Well, we have an issue too because we talked about this last We did night. talk about this. You like Giordano's. I love Giordano's. I enjoy it, but I love Lou Malnati's. Let us know why you love Giordano's. What's your favorite reason why? I don't necessarily have one particular reason. It's not that it's not that it there, there's like a certain feature. Mm. It's just so good. <laughs> I don't even know how to explain it. Like it's thick. It's it's got a lot of cheese. It, the crust is like a pie. Uh. I don't know. It just it's it's amazing. I almost said the F word. It's it's <laughs> it's freaking amazing. I don't even know what else to say except I just think it's the uh, greatest thing ever. See, I love Giordano's, but I love to enjoy more than one slice. And if I have oh one no, I one, eat a whole pie. A pie? Yeah, I have one. I pass out. No, good for you. You're a rookie. <laughs> I like Balnetti's because it has a raised edge to the crust. It's crunchy. So does Giordano's. Yeah, but this is different. But it's also like it's not as heavier per per per, per slice. Plus, I can have a lot more. So I think it's a taste preference. I love you can have a lot more slices, but overall, are you having more content? I, 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 I want the whole pie. I can't do a whole pie with Giordano's. That's why I jumped to Lumanati's. But either way, it's a win-win. Calories are there. It's a delicious pizza. But we're ready for a little nap after you eat it. Usually, when we had students in the past for CS, we'd treat them to Giordano's or Lumanati's. And we'd tell them after the day course is over, we'd have a slice because typically, you pass out after a couple of slices. Yeah, I don't partake too much because it's uh, I'm trying to watch my figure as I get older. Uh huh. But uh, right. if you are watching this and you are Chicago. familiar with Chicago yeah. or you've lived there, let us know which one you prefer and why. Uh, I mean, I will go to my grave saying Giordano's is the best deep dish in Chicago. Um, and that's all I have to say about that. My, I mean, I'm flying back to Chicago soon, so I'll probably have to venture into a little Giordano's, take a few pictures, some food porn, and send it your way. <laughs> Lovely. All right, guys, that's it for today. Hope you found that to be helpful. If you did, hit the thumbs up button below. And if you're not yet subscribed, hit subscribe. Hit the little bell so we can send you a notification every time we release a brand new video. And as always, we appreciate you for sticking around until the end. We'll see you on the next episode. Bye-bye, guys. Bye.